السلام عليكم ورحمة الله أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا كتب عليكم الصيام كما كتب على الذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقون أياما معدودات فمن كان منكم مريضا أو على سفر فعدة من أيام أخر وعلى الذين يطيقونه فدية طعام مسكين فمن تطوع خيرا فهو خير له وأن تصوموا خير لكم إن كنتم تعلمون شهر رمضان الذي أنزل فيه القرآن هدى للناس وبينات من الهدى والفرقان فمن شهد منكم الشهر فليصم ومن كان مريضا أو على سفر فعدة من أيام أخر يريد الله بكم اليسر ولا يريد بكم العسر ولتكملوا العدة ولتكبروا الله على ما هداكم ولعلكم تشكرون وإذا سألك عبادي عني فإني قريب أجيب دعوة الداع إذا دعان فليستجيبوا لي وليؤمنوا بي لعلهم يرشدون أحل لكم ليلة الصيام الرفث إلى نسائكم هن لباس لكم وأنتم لباس لهن علم الله أنكم كنتم تختانون أنفسكم فتاب عليكم وعفى عنكم فالآن باشروهن وابتغوا ما كتب الله لكم وكلوا واشربوا حتى يتبين لكم الخيط الأبيض من الخيط الأسود من الفجر ثم أتم الصيام إلى الليل ولا تباشروهن وأنتم عاكفون في المساجد تلك حدود الله فلا تقربوها كذلك يبين الله آياته للناس لعلهم يتقون ولا تأكلوا أموالكم بينكم بالباطل وتدنوا بها إلى الحكام لتأكلوا فريقا لتأكلوا فريقا من أموال الناس بالإثم وأنتم تعلمون يسألونك عن الأهلة قل هي مواقيت للناس والحج 
وليس البر بأن تأتوا البيوت من ظهورها ولكن البر من اتقى وأتوا البيوت من أبوابها واتقوا الله لعلكم تفلحون وقاتلوا في سبيل الله الذين يقاتلونكم ولا تعتدوا إن الله لا يحب المعتدين إن شاء الله we will soon be hosting a unique and a general generous guest a guest that only visits us once in a year. A guest that brings mercy and forgiveness. A guest that brings us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and closer to his paradise and keeps us away from the shaitan and the hellfire. The guest that I'm talking about is obviously Ramadan. And as Muslims, we are advised that, that we should be generous to our guests. We should be good to our guests. And why is it not that, that we should be the most best to the guests that we'll be receiving in about 12 days? That is the guest of Ramadan. The Salaf, they used to prepare for this six months in advance. Six months in advance preparing and praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He gives them life so that they may experience Ramadan. And then they used to pray for another six months after Ramadan, asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept it from them. And one of the Sahabas of the Prophet he said that let not be the day that you fast and the day that you do not fast be the same day. Meaning that when we fast it should be completely different. One of the scholars who has passed away, may Allah have mercy on him and grant him Jannah, he gave a comparison. He said that if you have a homeless man who you smell, who has not had food for many days, who is hungry and you take him and you put him in a five-star hotel and you tell him you can do what you like you can eat whatever food you like you can use the showers you can use the bed you can do anything you like for the next 30 days so that he can better himself get away from the bad condition but 30 days later he comes back and he's lying in the bed he's not taking a shower he's not taking advantage of the food he's not taking advantage of anything this is like the person who when Ramadan comes and it goes and they have not changed they have not taken the benefits from Ramadan they have not made it a lesson for them and this is why we have to prepare for Ramadan and this is what the topic today is going to be the devil's departure as the shaitan leaves how do we prepare for Ramadan so that Ramadan changes us so that we can be closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to address this today we have Sheikh Bilal Asad who's come all the way all the way from Australia he was born in Williamstown, is that, did I say right? Williamstown, yes. in Melbourne. He did his early education in Sharia in Lebanon. And then he did his tertiary education back in Australia in biomedical sciences. He, I believe, by profession is a teacher. And he has authored many children's books. One of them called The Story of Adam alayhi salam, and that's been published. And he's also done many popular works on the internet, mainly titled Ahmad the Repenter. Those who desire paradise and the compassion of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and those who are lucky, in the month of Ramadan, flock to pray tarawih behind him, and just as you have witnessed, that Allah has blessed him with a beautiful voice. So, without any further ado, I want to start, inshallah, and give the mic to Brother Bilal Asad to address us about the devil's departure. Waheekum, jazakum Allah khair. بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Yes, it is my pleasure to be here and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our good work and to reward you and I thank you for uh, hosting me the people of UK, the Muslims, my brothers and sisters الحمد لله we are brothers and sisters no matter where we are and all the way from across the uh, earth uh, to here we have a common bond and I feel that I am actually among my family brothers and sisters in Islam the devil's departure Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us 
that when Ramadan approaches, the eight doors of Jannah are open. The seven doors of hellfire are closed. The mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is bestowed. The forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is released. And the shayateen, the devils, are locked up. All of this is out of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon us. And imagine that it was showering rain, which you're very used to. Perfect example. And the rain reaches every home. Except imagine that this rain had a specialty. Particular homes it won't reach. Imagine this rain are the drops of mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they choose the homes on which they will drop. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy, His forgiveness, His rewards will drop on certain people. And there are certain people who will be chosen for this Ramadan to feel the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through it. Imagine this Ramadan as an intensive course, a hurdle which you will jump this year on top of last year and then next year another hurdle and so on until you rise in your purity and you grow and develop. Let me take you backwards first. I want to start, since the topic is the devil's departure, I want to take you back to the time when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam alayhi salam. And a great debate broke out between the Lord of the world, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and one particular creature named Iblis alayhi la'natullah, the shaitan, the king of all the shayateen. We all know Iblis. We have to know who Iblis is. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, إِنَّ الشَّيْطَانَ عَدُوٌّ لَكُمْ فَاتَّخِذُوهُ عَدُوًا The shaitan is your enemy. So take him as an enemy. You've got to know your enemy. If you don't know your enemy, your enemy will get you. The Iblis is the king of your enemies. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the angels, إِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ إِنِّي خَالِقٌ بَشَرًا مِّن طِينٍ when your Lord said to the angels, I'm going to create a human being made out of clay. The angels were so surprised. They said, Ya Rabb. And he, what's this creation? They thought to themselves. Has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, is he angry at us? Have we shortcomings now towards our creator? Are we not worshipping Allah enough, us, the angels? Qalu, أَتَجْعَلُ فِيهَا مَنْ يُفْسِدُ فِيهَا وَيَسْفِكُ الدِّمَاءُ وَنَحْنُ نُسَبِّحُ بِحَمْدِكَ وَنُقَدِّسُ لَكَ Oh, our Lord, they said, are you going to create on earth someone who will corrupt it and shed blood on earth while we, the angels, we glorify your name and worship you perfectly? If it's after worship, then we worship you, Ya Rabb. Have we made, done something wrong in our worship? So they, they want to reply. You know, sometimes you make a statement about yourself to get an answer. These angels said, Ya Rabbi, we worship you, we glorify you. As if they're saying, do we not worship you and glorify you enough? So Allah gave him a very simple answer. Inni a'lamu ma la ta'lamun. He said, Qala, I know that which you do not know. There's something about this human being that you cannot understand in your status, in your creation, in your nature as angels. You can't understand it. These human beings are very special. I have valued them and I'm going to nurture them. You worship me involuntarily. You can't disobey me. I've created you that way. But these human beings, they're something different than all my creations. I'm going to create him from clay. The angels thought, well, we're created from nur, from light. As in the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. And there was another creature there, Iblis. He was a jinn made out of the fire. And he had a status with the angels. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam salam, And when he fashioned him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the angels, فَإِذَا سَوَّيْتُهُ وَنَفَخْتُ فِيهِ مِن رُوحِي فَقَعُوا لَهُ سَاجِدِينَ when I have fashioned him and created him, not at that point prostrate to him, not at that point, 
and then I have placed into him from my soul. It's a special soul Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created. He said, فَقَعُ The letter fa means immediately bow down in prostration to him. So therefore, we have been honored with something called the soul. And Allah has valued us with that. Allah favored us with that. And this soul, my dear brothers and sisters, I want you to remember it now throughout our topic tonight. I'm going to refer to it a lot. Because Ramadan and fasting has got so much to do with the soul. And the second element that it has so much to do with is something called an nafs. And an nafs is made up of these three elements, the soul, the mind, and the body. This nafs has got desires. It's got temptations. It has whims and desires. And you can nurture it until it becomes more valuable than the angels, so it goes in line with your soul, or you can obey its desires and bring yourself down even lower than the animal. The thing that we have that angels don't have is choice. And the thing that we have been valued with and honored with is something called the special soul. Although the angels have a soul, we have a special soul which he did not share it with any other creation. So Allah has honored us from the beginning, brothers and sisters. I want to emphasize this matter for a reason, insha'Allah, that will, insha'Allah, reveal itself as I speak about this topic. Allah says in the Qur'an, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمَ وَحَمَلْنَاهُمْ فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ وَرَزَقْنَاهُمْ مِنَ الطَّيِّبَاتِ وَرَزَقْنَاهُمْ مِنَ الطَّيِّبَاتِ وَفَضَّلْنَاهُمْ عَلَى كَثِيرٍ مِّمَّنْ خَلَقْنَا تَفْضِيلًا And we have truly honored the son of Adam. And we made them rise and float above the sea and the land. And we made everything subjected to them. Do you not see? We made everything subjected to them and made them favored over every other creation that we have made favorable. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has honored us from the beginning. And He loves us tremendously. And His mercy is a nurturing like the nurturing of the mother, but beyond that, mashallah. So Allah said to the angels, bow down to this. Except one, Iblis, he wasn't among the angels. He bowed down to he refused to bow down to Adam alayhi salam. Now listen to this conversation. Allah said to him, why do you not want to bow down with one who I've created with my own hands? Iblis replied by saying, Ana khayrun minhu. I am better than him. You created him from clay and you created me from the fire. Can anyone tell me what Iblis neglected here? What is he avoiding? He said, I am better than him. And the reason he gave was, you made him from the clay and he made me from the fire. Is the reason that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded the angels and Iblis to bow down to him because of the fact that he created Adam from clay or was it something else? So what is it that Iblis was avoiding to mention here? It was, I mentioned just before, can anyone tell me? The soul, yes. It was the soul. This special soul. Why did Iblis want to avoid mentioning the soul because he knows that this is where our value lies and when a person is envious of you and wants to put you down and raise himself up they begin this thing called character assassination and they begin to mention the lower qualities of yourselves and avoid the qualities which make you better than them this is Iblis so then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and him began a debate and he said to him, Iblis, Do you see this one whom you have honored above me? I am going to do this thing called ihtinak on his offspring. What does ihtinak mean? Literally it means to ride on top of a horse and steer it with its reins in any direction you please. A well-tamed horse. And you climb on top of this horse and you are an excellent rider and you begin to steer this horse in any direction you please. Whether the horse wants to go in that direction or not, you steer it. So Iblis made a promise and said, I shall steer and ride on top of them to the point where I am going to move them in any direction I will, just like the excellent rider 
he steers a well-tamed horse. Such delicate and intricate description. The shaitan has made a huge threat. In another verse, the shaitan said, See this one whom you have made me in error because of him, meaning Adam, because of him, now I'm in error. He said to him, and I want you to listen carefully to what he said here. It's very important for you to understand this. لَآتِيَنَّهُمْ I shall come to them. مِنْ بَيْنِ أَيْدِيهِمْ From in front of them. وَمِنْ خَلْفِهِمْ And from behind them. وَعَنْ أَيْمَانِهِمْ And from their right. وَعَنْ شَمَائِلِهِمْ And from their left. فَلَا وَلَا تَجِدُ أَكْثَرَهُمْ شَاكِرِينَ You will not find the majority of them grateful. You will not find the majority of them among the grateful. Does anyone know the opposite word in Arabic of shakir? It starts with a kaf. Opposite of shakir? Kafir. Correct. So shakir is when you notice and recognize and acknowledge the favors which someone has done for you. You appreciate them. Like when husband and wife, a good when they're in good relationship, the husband mentions the good qualities in his wife and praises her. And the wife remembers her husband and she appreciates the good he does for her. Rather than mentioning all the bad things every time, mashallah, some of them memorize it better than the Fatiha. So we have to remember and appreciate the good things in each other. So this is a shakir. A kafir is somebody who denies the favors of others and neglects them and avoids mentioning them. They know that they are there, but they don't want to mention them out of pridefulness, out of arrogance, out of stubbornness. So he said, you're going to find the majority of his offspring not grateful. They will deny your favors. They will think that they are better than being guided by you. They are going to think that they are stronger than to need the guidance of the Qur'an or your messengers. They are going to think that they are self-sufficient. They are going to think that they are the lords of the world. In fact, they're going to deny, deny you. And everything you do for them, they're going to interpret as being a form of suffering, punishment, or some other sort, to the point where they are going to disbelieve in your existence, my God. Iblis, this is what he was saying. Now I want you to analyze. He said, I shall come to them from the front and from the back. The Arabic word used here by Iblis is, لَآتِيَنَّهُمْ min, min their front, min their back. But when he mentioned the right and the left, he said, عَنْ their right and عَنْ their left. Min means directly, with, noth with nothing in between, no barrier. So he is going to directly come towards us from the front and from the back, with no barrier. Min means from a distance. Why from a distance from the right? And why from a distance from the left? Because of the two angels. There is an angel on the right and an angel on the left. Why have I mentioned this? I am emphasizing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's nurturing and protection of you from this enemy. Allah is saying on the right and the left I have given them a protection. Shaitan will not be able to approach you except very subtly from a distance. Because you see side, when someone hits you from the side, you, it's like uh, you get stunned by it. So the shaitan can't get you from the side. From the back, it means that he will deceive you. He will make you see something as if it was a reality, but it is actually false. Allah says in the Quran, الشَّيْطَانُ يَعِدُكُمُ الْفَقْرَ وَيَأْمُرُكُمْ بِالْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرُ The shaitan always makes you afraid, giving you a false promise that in the future you're going to get poor. So go ahead and earn your wealth from haram so that you don't get poor in the future. Your children, your family, you're going to be homeless. So go towards the haram before you go there and he tries to justify it for you. This is from the back. From the front, it is everything you see, you hear, your friends, how he entices people to come to you. He gets his allies who are the human shayateen. Did anyone know or realize that there are actually human shaitans? Right? There is shayateen al-ins and shayateen al-jinn. The Prophet ﷺ informed us that there are jinns who are shaitans and there are humans who are shaitans. The word shaitan literally means someone who has increased extreme in kufr, extreme in denial of truth, extreme in denial of favors. So the, the jinn who becomes a shaitan is extreme in their kufr, 
And the human being who becomes a shaitan is extreme in his or her denial and kufr and arrogance. Who is worse? The jinn shaitan or the human shaitan, do you think? Uh, the jinn shaitan? Hands up if you think the jinn shaitan. Hands up if you think the human shaitan. Okay, hands up if you think the angel shaitan. No, there's no angel shaitan. <laughs> there's no angel shaitan. I was just tricking you there. Um, the jinn shaitan and the human shaitan, the human shaitan is worse than the jinn shaitan. Because there are words of dhikr that you can say that get rid of the jinn shaitan. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim. He's gone. My little daughter, she's about five or six years old now. If, I, I regret the day I told her, when you enter the toilet, say, A'udhu billahi minal khubthi wal khabat. Now she thinks every time she goes in there, there's a shaitan waiting for us. And now she stands, A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim. I said, that's enough daughter. She's gone. He's gone. You've killed him. You've destroyed him. He's finished. So you can get rid of the jinn shaitan. You can recite Quran, off he goes. You can call the adhan and off he goes. You can say Bismillah when you enter your home, off he goes. And you can come into the month of Ramadan and he is trapped. As for the human shaitan, you say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem, they're still in your face. Ya Ammi, Qul A'udhu Rabbi Nas, Qul Rabbi Falak, they're still there. Huh? What are you saying? It doesn't go away. So what does the shaitan do when Ramadan comes? He prepares some allies to leave them behind to represent him while he is trapped. So some people are wondering, how do you justify or consile this hadith that the Prophet ﷺ said, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or that the shayateen are tusaffat shayateen they are imprisoned and chained up during Ramadan yet a lot of us we get temptations and whispers during Ramadan isn't that right? we still get whispers in Ramadan the meaning of that is number one the shaytan prepares allies before Ramadan comes so bad friends whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy does not reach them remember the rain that falls on the homes? the rain that falls on the homes well this type of a person's heart is so dark and so full of rust and has neglected the Qur'an and Salat for so long during the year that not even the month of Ramadan or any Qur'an or any masjid can affect them anymore. Their soul is not nurtured. So the shaitan uses these people to do what? To influence the Muslims, the believers, the ones whose souls are strong. He leaves them behind during Ramadan. The other thing the shaitan does is he whispers to you and puts in doubts in your minds on top of your desires before Ramadan comes. So my brothers and sisters in Islam, let me mention one particular thing before I move on about the shaitan. One thing that we must be aware of. A lot of people assume that, or a lot of people unfortunately today, they prepare for Ramadan exactly on the night or the eve of Ramadan. In the night when everybody's debating and arguing, is Ramadan today or tomorrow? This group does it this way, this group does it that way. And then uh, there is a disunity that happens <laughs> on the eve of Ramadan. <laughs> so the shaitan is there right up to the eve of Ramadan. And then the person begins to fast Ramadan and tries to do all the good deeds. And then by the time Ramadan ends, it's like nothing happened. It's like as if it was a wave, a sudden wave that came and went. It's not a leap, it's not a hurdle for them. But then there are people who prepare two months before Ramadan. Did you not hear the Prophet ﷺ informing us about the virtue of Rajab? You know the month of Rajab. It comes, it's the second last month before Ramadan. It's the month before this one. Rajab, Rasul ﷺ used to increase in fasting. Then Shawwal came. And Aisha radiallahu anha used to say, I never saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam increasing in his worship, fasting more and donating more in charity than, and doing actions of good deeds more than any other month other than Ramadan, more than the month of Shawwal. Why is the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam teaching us to prepare this way? Because the shaitan is ready. The shaitan is ready. And your desire, your nafs, is going to get the better of you. So you need to train it just before Ramadan so that you can get the best, the best out of Ramadan. My brother here mentioned the beautiful 
uh, story about the tabi'in, about the Sahaba of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. When they used to prepare for Ramadan, it was six months in advance. And when Ramadan finished, they they stayed for six months after it, worshiping Allah and making du'a to Allah subhanahu wa taala to specifically have accepted the rewards of Ramadan. So it's a whole year round. It's not just one month. The shaitan knows this and he is your enemy. And the shaitan knows that the month of Ramadan they're going to be away. So they have to prepare to make you lose. They have to prepare to make you lose. So we prepare a little bit before it. If you are still able to, we are still in the month of Shawwal. Increase in your fasting. And there's no specific day in Shawwal where you should increase your fasting. Our Rasul Sallallahu used to increase his deeds in all of Shawwal. And wallahi, wallahi, it has its enormous effect on you by the time you reach Ramadan. You will be more prepared, more ready than anyone else. And in fact, you'll be the type that will feel that secret mercy which is bestowed upon an individual during Ramadan of an enormous energy that no one else can feel. You'll find yourself being able to wake up in the middle of the night without any problems. Your eyes will just open automatically at the time of suhoor and it's like you've slept all night. Your heart will complete, will continue pumping as though it is reading Quran. Wallahi, I know of people who are so used to their words repeating the Quran during Ramadan that when they go to sleep and they wake up, they feel that the lips were dry as though they were reading the Quran all night. These are people who have prepared themselves. You know, if you want to run up a hill, a very steep hill, and there is a flat land before it, you don't wait until you get to the edge of the hill and start running upwards. That's going to take tremendous effort. But you start running a long pace beforehand on flat land so that when you reach the high steep at least you will get that extra strength to get you halfway there with ease and only halfway you need to put the energy. Because Ramadan is an uphill and when you reach the top insha'Allah Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did say رَغِمَ أَنفُهُ رَغِمَ أَنفُهُ رَغِمَ أَنفُهُ May his nose be rubbed in dust three times and the Sahaba said who ya Rasulullah? He said مَنْ بَلَغَ رَمَضَانِ وَلَمْ يُغْفَرْ لَهُ Whoever reaches Ramadan and they haven't been forgiven. So there is no greater opportunity than the time of Ramadan for our forgiveness. O oh, you who has regretted their sins. O oh, you who knows of secret sins that no one else knows about. And you, and you cry in the night and you feel so guilty about it and you've given up almost hope. This is your time, insha'Allah ta'ala, to get rid of this burden off your shoulders and for it to replace in your heart a sweetness, sweetness, sweetness of happiness, of iman that you have never felt before. Brothers and sisters in Islam, the shaitan comes directly from the front, directly from the back through his allies and he, through his deception and from the front through his allies and leaving a seed in your desires before Ramadan and from the sides, the shaitan finds it difficult. The, sh the angels are there. My question is, and here is where the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his love for you is really shown. Why didn't Iblis mention from above and from the bottom? He said, I will come to them from the front, the back, the sides, but he didn't mention, وَمِن فَوْقِهِمْ وَمِن تَحْتِهِمْ Have you ever thought about that? وَمِن فَوْقِهِمْ وَمِن تَحْتِهِمْ And I will approach them from the, above them and from beneath them. Why didn't he say that? Because he knows that above you, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whose mercy descends upon you. And when you lift your arms up to Allah in dua, Allah does not allow any evil, any obstacle, any distraction between you calling upon your dear Lord and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responding to His beloved servant. It's a direct, direct connection. And Allah says in the Quran, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ إِذَا دَعَانِ فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُوا لِي وَلْيُؤْمِنُوا بِي لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْشُدُونَ And if my servants ask you about me, O Messenger of God, tell them. Messenger of Allah, tell them, I am close, I am very close. You know, like what a mother says to a child when the child wakes up in the night and it's very, and the child's very scared, seen a nightmare. Mom, Dad, and they come close to them and they say, don't worry, I'm here, I'm close, I'm with you. You go to school and they say, don't worry, I'm with you. Just remember your mom, remember your dad. You know, I'm with you. When a dear friend tells you wherever you go, just hold this, remember, I'm with you. 
So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you like the nurturing mother saying to its child, I am with you. For inni qareeb, I am close. I will respond to the person who calls upon me when they call. So let them respond to my call. Let them respond to me. Because the way that I command you, Allah is saying, is the way to me. Is the way to me. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us something or prohibits us something, He is actually drawing the line or the road for you in how to get to close to Him, how to feel His presence, subhanahu wa ta'ala. To the point where, to the point where you continue to do the compulsory actions until you do the voluntary actions after that, until Allah says, I become your eye which you see with, your hearing which you hear with, your leg which you walk with, your hand which you touch with. And if you were to ask me for anything, I will give you. And if you seek refuge in me from anything, I will give you protection. And there is nothing worse to me, Allah says, hated to me, than the time when I have to take the soul of that person out. And he is feeling the pain while I hate to do so. But only to bring him back to me. Brothers and sisters in Islam. Al Iblis said, I will not come. Iblis did not mention from the bottom. Why not from the bottom? Because... When you put your head down in sujood, and sujood is only to Allah, do we make sajda to anyone else? No, we don't. It is forbidden to bow down or make sajda to any cre crea cre creation except for to the Creator. So when you make that sujood, it is a special connection between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Iblis cannot and the shaitan cannot interfere between you and Allah. So there are two very close connections. In your dua to Allah when you are standing, sitting on your side. And in your sujood, where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, أَقْرَبُ مَا يَكُونُ الْعَبْدُ لِرَبِّهِ وَهُوَ سَاجِدٌ The closest time a servant is to Allah is when they are in prostration. So make your dua in prostration. The shaitan understood that these are two avenues. But guess what? In order for the shaitan not to come to you this way, there is one condition. He said, وَعِزَّتِكَ وَجَلَالِكَ لَأُغْوِيَنَّهُمْ أَجْمَعِينَ I shall deter them all and lead them astray except one type of servants. Who are they? إِلَّا عِبَادَكَ مِنْهُمُ الْمُخْلَصِينَ Except your servants, not all of them, among them who are sincere, who are Sincere. The ones who when no one is looking, they worship Allah still very well. The ones who when no one is around them, they still abandon the haram. They are not the ones who are only in front of people, they act religious. But when they are alone, it makes no difference. Yes, some people are lazy when they are alone. Some people maybe feel motivated when they are around pious people. That's different. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the fact that these people in front of others, they put on a show. And when they are alone, they don't care whatsoever. These people are not righteous and the shaitan has, doesn't care about them. Doesn't care about them. He doesn't care that they're going to uh, you know, be a problem for him. They are his allies. These are the people who will lead you astray. If you haven't prepared yourself. Brothers and sisters in Islam, having said this, the shaitan went on his way. And what does he do? The only thing the shaitan does, I mean, we all think that the shaitan is this powerful, strong being that makes us do things. No. The shaitan cannot make you do anything. So when he is trapped or chained up in Ramadan, why do you get whispers? Why do people get temptations? There is only one thing left. It is our desires. The nafs. As the woman of the Aziz in Surat Yusuf, who seduced Yusuf alayhi salam, when it was revealed that she was the guilty one, she said, وَمَا أُبَرِّئُ nafsi." I do not say that my nafs is innocent. إِنَّ النَّفْسَ لَأَمَّارَةٌ بِالسُّوءٍ إِلَّا مَا رَحِمَ رَبِّي the nafs truly likes to command you naturally to do bad things all the time. Except whom Allah has given mercy. So my brothers and sisters in Islam, in Ramadan the shaitan is chained up but our desires are left. Out of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he helps us by taking the shaitan's whispers away. And we do feel it. The whispers are much less during Ramadan. But when our desires are high, we get these human whispers. 
So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helps us to nurture our nafs. When we don't eat and drink, our energy levels go down. When your energy levels are down, you don't feel like going out too much. You don't feel like being too active too much. If a haram thought comes to your mind, and possibly you do feel it, I mean, I've all, I've, I teach students who are youth, 15 years old, 14 years old, 16 years old, they say, but I still feel like doing haram and being active in Ramadan. I say to them, but it's not exactly the same as when you are full of energy. When you're very hungry, it's different. You may feel like you want to do something haram, but your energy levels stop you at a certain point. You get tired of it. Because when the energy levels are down, then the level of desires is also down. My brothers and sisters in Islam, Allah says about this nafs, He says, this nafs and the way Allah fashioned it. He gave it the tendency to do evil and He gave it the tendency to have piety. Whoever, whoever purifies this nafs has succeeded and whoever obeys this nafs has lost and failed. If you leave a person alone, alone without food or water, they can become cannibals. Even though right now, if I asked anyone over here, would you eat your friend? You would say, no, I won't eat my friend. I wouldn't even dream of it. What do you mean cannibals? That's disgusting. You know, some people, when they come to eat food, there's certain food they can't eat. They can't digest. Some people don't like tomato. Some people don't like onions. Some people don't like uh, asparagus or whatever you want, right? Some kids, they get home from school, Mum's cooked, uh, I'll say it in, in Lebanese, lubi again. Child says, lubi? The other day you made malfouf, lubi every day, why don't you make malfouf today? <laughs> and they start losing it at their mother. The husband comes back from work. Why isn't the food ready yet? No desserts? Where's the qahwa? This person is trained to overcome this desire during Ramadan. But, if you left this person alone without food or water, they will eat the asparagus, they will eat the onions, they will eat the lubi again, they will eat that malfouf, they will eat their friend. Yes, they will. In fact, they will murder, they will pillage, they will steal. They will even cheat and betray their own family members. They'll possibly put themselves before even their brother or sister, before their parents before their children possibly, the human being can become the most evilest of evil if you were to let them go because this nafs, you don't know what it is capable of brothers and sisters. Don't ever say to yourself, don't ever say to yourself, I'm strong, I can bear it. I can be alone with another girl in the room, alone, for hours on end and I will be the most pious of pious. Don't fool yourself. Don't fool yourself. Don't be silly. Don't be silly. Our Rasul for example, said about this nafs, No man and woman who are not lawful for each other are alone in one room long enough, except that the shaitan is their third. Now we said that the shaitan is not only the jinn, but the shaitan is also your desires, the human shaitan. So we have to be aware that this nafs of ours can lead us astray to evil. And therefore, Ramadan and fasting is a way of nurturing it. The other thing we need to be aware of is this. This nafs can also be what nurtured and can be uh, purified. How do you purify this nafs, this desire? Well, by nurturing your soul. By nurturing your soul. And the way we nurture our soul is with dhikr. Remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You should start this dhikr now. Now. Start your night prayers now if you can. Night prayers means any prayer after Isha until Fajr. Why don't you start something called Salat al-Duha from now? It's in the middle of the day, just before Dhuhr time. About 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 8 o'clock, after the sun rises, it's Duha prayer. 2, 4, 8, 
as many as you like. Why don't you from now start to train yourself and make a plan that every Wednesday, every Asr, for example, of every day, I'm going to spend 20 minutes reading the Quran. Yes, maybe you don't know how to read the Quran. Maybe you don't know Arabic. Maybe when you read the Quran, you stutter, you find it hard, it's difficult upon you. Then I say to you this, Ar Rasul Sallallahu said, you get double the reward. Double. Maybe you've memorized some Quran off by heart. You don't have to read it. Ar Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi was illiterate. How did he read it? He memorized it. So why don't you read Al-Fatiha or a few verses of Abu Jaza Amma? What stops you from that? Read them over and over again. For every letter there is ten hasanat. And when you get that, automatically, my dear brothers and sisters, don't think about it. Don't think about it. Automatically your soul becomes nourished and you will feel a strength of spirituality that you haven't felt before. One brother said to me, and I shared this with him, he said, Subhanallah, brother. I, op I opened up this book called Fortress of the Muslim. Fortress of the Muslim. Husn al-Muslim. Hands up if you have that book. Very good, MashaAllah. I'm so happy. You're doing your work very well, brother. MashaAllah and your allies. So, Husn al-Muslim, you grab that book and there are adhkar, words of remembrance. For example, there is one which you can say 10 times a day or a, or a hundred times a day. It's very easy on the tongue. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi. Subhanallah al-Azim. Let's all say it together. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi. Subhanallah al-Azim. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi Subhanallah al -azim. Sounds better than music, isn't it? Better than R&B Right? Oh God, they told me don't joke in the UK <laughs> They don't laugh too much <laughs> Alright, I'll stick to my natural self Okay, so the adhkar which you say during the day really nourish your soul immensely Saying these words over and over again, Wallahi al-Azim, you'll start feeling yourself very special. You know why? Because you're nurturing your soul. You know when you uh, nourish your body, and you change your diet, and you start doing exercise, suddenly you find that everything about your mentality, about your brain, about your system, starts to run much better. The bags under the eyes start going. You wake up in the morning a little bit more with fresher skin. You start to work in your day with a lot more energy. And you think, how did this happen? Well, you've changed your diet automatically. Similarly, when you change the diet for your soul, then it is prepared, insha'Allah, to feel the closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. By the time you reach Ramadan, Allahu Akbar, the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descends upon you. The angels begin to make dua for you. The shaitans, off they go. The mercy of the forgiveness of Allah is opened. The doors of Jannah are opened. The Quran the month in which the Qur'an was sent down begins to nurture your soul. The people and their congregations begin to grow. You go to pray taraweeh, men and women, yes. You go and pray taraweeh and you feel the unity of the Muslims and the spirituality. And subhanAllah, you begin to feel this sudden energy, this a surge of energy like you've never felt before. Tell me if I'm wrong, subhanAllah. Correct me if I'm wrong. Wallahi, brothers and sisters. For the person who has prepared for Ramadan and anticipates it, that's the condition, and loves it, and looks forward to it and understands why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded you to fast, then during Ramadan, you find that you have this special surge of energy that you get up in the, at suhoor and you say to yourself, how am I able to do this right now? You go to the masjid and you say to yourself, how am I able to stand 20 raka'at praying taraweeh? How am I able to do that? How am I able to abstain from food and drink? In any other day, I would, you know, if I see food and drink, I can't wait to eat my best, you know, whatever tickles my fancy. But in Ramadan, you look at yourself and no one's looking. And you're so thirsty. You see the tap in front of you. You see the fridge in front of you. You can easily grab a bit of water and drink it. But you abstain from it. There's this guilt inside you. Where did this come from? Where did this come from? This is a secret rahmah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestowed upon you, O servant of Allah. Remember this. Your soul is being nourished, alhamdulillah. Your soul is being nourished. In Ramadan, the Prophet ﷺ said, every normal hasana that you do, good deed, is multiplied by... How many? 70. Good guess. But you were 60 hasanat off. 70 hasanat, brother. 70 hasanat. But guess what? Allah Rasul Sallallahu said that Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala says every action that you do is for you except for fasting. It is for me and I reward for it. What does it mean? It means that every action you do has a calculated amount of hasanat that you get. For example, if you recite the Quran, for every letter that you read, you have 10 hasanat. But in Ramadan, it's multiplied by 70. The only difference is there is extra reward in Ramadan, which only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows how much it's worth.
These extra rewards, the angels don't even know about them. And on the day of judgment, after all your deeds are scaled and weighed, and you think that you may enter hellfire because your deeds are not enough, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls his angels and says, I have with me here a reward for this servant of mine which I have kept and invested for him on his behalf and her behalf because they used to fast voluntarily for me and put these on his or her scale and enter my servant into Jannah. He left or she left the food and water and their temptation for me. And I am the only one who today will especially reward them for it. Not the angels. It is not calculated. In fact, it has no calculation. Why? Why all of this? Brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is nurturing you. Allah is looking after you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making you grow. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making you stronger. Like when a parent makes their child stronger. They tell them you have to do your homework. They punish them if they don't. You have to do your salat. They'll take away something from them if they don't do their salat. Then you grow up a little bit more. They let you out into the workforce. You know, they let go a little bit. They're training you. You go for your driving test, right? You have to drive by yourself. You have to go through it. You go through some burdens and through some suffering. You are only growing through that suffering. You are only growing through that suffering. And fasting creates for you an enormous, tremendous, unbelievable conscious like you have never felt before. When you fast this Ramadan, inshallah, brothers and sisters, think about this. Use your, see this pain that you go through, the fasting and the pain of thirst? I want you to think about it. Reflect upon this pain and say to yourself this, Subhanallah, I have chosen, I have chosen to fast for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in order for me to gain a growth for it. And I know what Allah wants from me is something great. When you see, when you feel this pain, think about this. For every pain that you are feeling, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving you rewards upon rewards for it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Rahim, He's forgiving. Think about this. When the day of judgment comes, you will look back at this life and think to yourself, Wallahi, it only seemed like one day. Fas'alul adin, ask those who can calculate, and they will say, In labithtum illa yawma. You know, all this life from the beginning of Adam till the end of time will seem to us like it was only one day and you will say to yourself Alhamdulillah I did not waste it don't be one of those who will say oh no I can't believe I complained and I didn't use that one day half a day a, you know, a speck of a speck of, of the time it, it f feels like it was nothing and I wasted it for this everlasting world in Jannah brothers and sisters Think about what you are going to gain out of, this food, out of this abstinence from food. Think about the empathy that you will be developing. Think about the people who are fasting involuntarily around the world. Think about how grateful you are to what Allah, for what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. We appreciate things when they are not with us, right? Think about the fact that when you're fasting, you no longer think about uh, what we call first world problems. You know what first world problems are? First world problems? Damn man, I haven't, my, I haven't had my coffee today. Do you have coffee here in the UK? Is coffee a big thing for you? It's a big thing in Australia. Is it a big thing for you? Not if, it's, if it is. No? You're just staring at me. Okay, this is called a greasy in Aussie language. Greasy meaning you're just looking at me. Okay, if coffee is a big thing and I worry, oh, you know, I've got a bad temper today, I haven't had my coffee. Or first world problems. Oh man, what's this? The, you know, the shower is not hot enough for me. Mom, switch it off. The water's gone cold. Don't you know I'm in here? Don't you care about me? And we lose this temper at our parents, at our brothers, our sisters. First of all, problem issues, man. When you're fasting, you look at yourself and say, man, I don't care about the water. I don't care about the coffee. I don't care about this. I don't care about the blanket. I don't care about it. I just want my food. I just want my water. Suddenly you find yourself that, oh my God, you don't really need all of that stuff. All the stuff they advertise on television and try to make you want it, you don't need it. But they make us need it. So fasting protects you against commercialized, commercialized um, products. They make you feel like you need to do this. You need to be like that. You need to buy this. Subhanallah. And Ramadan is all about not wasting. So it's about saving. And it's about fixing your mentality and knowing that in this life it is only a temporary enjoyment. And it is a deception. When you fast in Ramadan, you look at yourself and you say, Subhanallah. Wallahi truly. This life is nothing but a temporary deception. I am only a wayfarer. I'm passing by. Insha'Allah I can do this. And insha'Allah I will reap the benefits at the end of it. Insha'Allah Ta'ala. 
my brothers and sisters, I have been given the time to stop and we'll stop here insha'Allah and give you some maybe a few minutes insha'Allah for any questions that are relevant to the topic. I thank you for listening and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us reap the true benefits of this coming of Ramadan and to make us stronger against our nafs and our desires, make our families more stronger and together. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring our hearts together more and to unite the cause of our Muslim, uh, Muslim brothers and sisters and to assist us against ourselves and against the shaitan. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this Ramadan one in which he will heal our hearts and heal our souls. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pardon us for our shortcomings. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum fa astaghfiruh. Wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Shukran ya Rabbi shukran. Hadayta qalbi shukran. Nawarta darbi shukran. Shukran ya Rabbi shukran. Hadayta qalbi shukran.